Good, let's get started since we're there anyway. We expected a, a, a bit more, but maybe it's because of the end of the day is approaching and that the fatigue is, is, is pouring in. But um, you know it's all about quality, not quantity. So I think we're, we're very happy to kick the session off. Um, maybe I'll, I'll kick off first, then we do a short introduction of all the people on the panel. Then we will have a presentation of Food Drink Europe on the latest uh, and greatest uh, research on investment gaps. Uh, two pieces of work there, and then we go back to the discussion and questions. Uh, if you want to use the app, that's fine, but we can also just ask questions in person. I would really prefer that. So just raise your hand um, if you have questions, because I like to have some kind of uh, interaction. I'm always a big fan of interaction. Good, so my name is, is Michiel Draater. I'm, I'm uh, with EIT Food. Um, exciting maybe to mention is that EIT Food basically went to a lot of changes. We, we actually got more focused missions and we really focus on um, a new or an increased value proposition towards scope three reduction. So that's not obviously not the only thing that we're doing, but going forward, we really would like to take a value chain approach. And our strong intention is to conduct even two in-depth pilots uh, per value chain, can be a crop, can be dairy, and involve all the actors, including the corporates, uh, and also including the farmers. What you see is that the big corporates, they're organized for efficiency. Uh, and uh, they know their consumer. They do not necessarily know the farmers that well. Vice versa, the farmers are not, let's say, too big of a fan of the Unilevers of this world. So I think we uh, as EIT Food have a role to play in, in orchestration, and we have the whole ecosystem uh, in our hands. Uh, and also, uh, I don't know whether you are aware, but there are priority frameworks out there. McKinsey has done a lot of work, for instance, in greenhouse gas abatement cost curves that basically already provide you a roadmap, even though it's not measured data, but it's, it's um, theoretical data, basically enough to have some kind of priority on um, innovation. Because um, a lot of... Uh, instruments uh, and innovation is already there, but also some are not there. And how great could it be that we can uh, move towards a top-down definition of the innovation portfolio and know exactly what it would lead to uh, and know roughly what it would cost. That would really um, uh, very much increase the efficiency and effectiveness of our um, innovation funds. Now, talking about uh, uh, funds and, and GAP, we are going to talk today about financing. We have two groups of uh, panelists. We have the public finance, so to speak, the EIF and the EIC, and we'll do a short introduction uh, before we go to the presentation. And we have the farmer perspective. Uh, Pavel, you're unfortunately alone. We uh, expected uh, uh, Marion to represent the young farmers, but she couldn't uh, unfortunately make it. Um, so feel free to take a bit more time. Um, maybe we start with a short introduction, and I just start with the, the ladies first. Uh, Adelaide, uh, maybe very short, uh, uh, the organization you are presenting and, and roughly what you are doing before we go into the depth. Sure, thanks, and uh, very pleased to be with you all this afternoon. Uh, so my name is Adelaide Krakow. I head the Climate and Environmental uh, impact investment activities within the European Investment Fund. Uh, for those of you that may not be familiar with our organization, we are part of the European Investment Bank Group, and our primary mission really is to make you know financing accessible to innovative and high-growth small to medium-sized enterprises. Um, we do so through two main financing tools or business lines, uh, the first being uh, guarantees to banks, financial institutions, microfinance organizations that can facilitate their lending to, again, SMEs. And then the second line, which I am part of, is our equity investments business, whereby we partner with VC and PE fund managers to really you know, put more capital into the market towards innovation and, again, the growth of European enterprises. 
So we really don't make uh, direct investments ourselves, but partner again with um, these financial institutions and fund managers who have that proximity to the market and can really provide value-add support in addition to financing. Um, within the agri-food industry, it's, it's obviously a strategic sector for us. We're really trying to support the value chain, um, you know, whether it be from agri-food production through loans to small farmers all the way through you know, agri-food innovation or more consolidated agri-food businesses through venture capital and private equity financing. Um, we heard it earlier, you know, the uh, food agri-food industry in general has a big climate environmental footprint, is also facing significant challenges related to climate and environment, and as a consequence, you know, sustainability is really top of the agenda for us, and that's why it's encompassed within our climate environmental investment activities. Um, I'll explain a little bit later what we've been doing, but that's just to give yeah, a brief introduction as to who we are and our role in the market. Thank you, Pavel. Thank you, Michel. It's a pleasure for me to be here, so thank you for the invitation, of course. My name is Paweł Kaczmarek. I came from Midwest Poland. Uh, I was born in 1983, so as you can see, I'm quite old still. Yeah, even you are not able to see my hair. <laughs> I, I lose them during the last few years. Uh, however, I was born and grew up on a very small farm, 25 hectares with mixed production. Just after graduate, I became the manager on quite large scale uh, farm, 2,300 hectares, when I was responsible for plant protection. And I was really excited about all these new things what I've met during studying, you know, all this fungicide, all these fantastic pesticides uh, delivered by uh, industry. And I start to implement all these new things into the life and, and very fast recognize that this is not the answer for my needs, that the effect what I had was totally different uh, than I expected. So I've started to change my management more into the biological. So I've started to reduce the consumption of synthetic uh, fertilizer, of uh, synthetic pesticides, try to introduce organic fertilizer, try to reduce the soil disturbance and implement the minimum tillage. At the beginning, I had no idea that this, what I al already started, was some type of regenerative farming. Today, after 15 years, I recognize that this type of management is actually regenerative farming. We start to looking uh, behind the ocean <coughs> where the pioneers of regenerative farming are, like Gareth Zimmer or Real Truleda. We start to follow them, implement the solutions in our life. And it was the, the reason that in 2019 we established the foundation. This foundation called Terra Nostra, and Terra Nostra shared the knowledge about regenerative farming, support farmers in the conversion, and currently I'm the supervisory board representative for Terra Nostra. Thank you. Michiel? Uh, I went to university in the year you were born. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, so I'm not the same age. Yeah. I even before. <laughs> yeah, I know that. Um, my name is Michiel Scheffer. I'm the president of European Innovation Council. And the European Innovation Council is the, the newest loot on the European innovation stem. And the objective is to fund the transition from research uh, to um, well, commercial industrial applications. So we have two, in two types of instruments. One instrument called the Pathfinder, but Transition does roughly the same. So Pathfinder Transition funds really the generation of uh, pilots and, and business models out of academic research. And more important is the Accelerator. The Accelerator is a combination of grants and fund together with the EIB, so the the, 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 the cousins in, in Luxembourg as well, um, where we provide so grant and equity up to 17.5 million euros together, two and a half grant maximum 15 million equity to promote uh, companies to scale up. Uh, one of the themes, we have 10, ten uh, essential themes. One of them is agri-food. I'm very happy that my program manager, Ivan Stefanic, is here available. So for further questions on details, please consult him. Um, and uh, one of the themes I have a passion is, is the protein transition. So that's one of the ones important, but there's also other, uh, other techniques of uh, fermentation is an important theme, for example. But also a theme which is important is not only, that say, agro and food, but also agro and materials. Because if we have to become um, fossil free by 2050, uh, the only result is that the agriculture will be the basis of our materials. Uh, so that's also something I want to, I want personally to explore, and I hope that we are able to get that lo longer term in our programs in a stronger way. Um, 
So we come in terms of funding before the EIB and the EIF. So, uh, so the, the the companies that are successful are successful in the EIC instruments. Then, basically, are supposed to flow to the EIF. So that will start happening in in a year or two, uh, because it's a new instrument. We only started three years ago with uh, with funding. Great, Michiel. Thanks for the short introduction. Now, I would like to ask uh, uh, Will Sermon to. I hope I pronounce your name correctly, Will. Um, to give us a presentation of the state of affairs, the, the, the very recent uh, research on how Europe is doing in terms of uh, innovation investments. Whatever you like. Thank you very much. Um, I'm not quite sure where I'm going to go. I'll go here because I've got a couple of slides <coughs> to show you. So first of all, thank you very much. Um, my name is Will. I'm from Food Drink Europe where I'm Deputy Director General. And actually the first thing I should tell you, you spoke about the relationship between corporates and farmers. Well, I am the where the Venn diagram meets because I'm from a farming background. Grew up on a farm in the UK. My brother is still farming. Um, I've spent a lot of time driving tractors and getting my hands dirty. Um, but now I work for Food Drink Europe, which is the the uh, food and drink manufacturing sector. So companies that you would have heard of like Unilever and Danone and Kraft Heinz, um, Mars, PepsiCo, etc. But it's a very broad and vast industry. So it's not just the big companies. It's 294,000 food and drink manufacturers in Europe alone. So it's a big sector with big potential for big impact. Now, I've got something very exciting for you today. It's the thought starter for this conversation. I basically enter stage left and then leave stage right after five minutes. But I want to give you a good thought starter. So these are, these are figures that have never been seen before. Well, actually, I've seen them. But this is the first time they've been seen publicly. And it's, there, are, there are two recent studies. The Food Drink Europe study is not yet published, but will be published in the coming weeks. And there's an EIT food study with Lux Research that is published today. And I think it might be... We will share it on the it'll be shared web. on the web. And I'm going to talk to you a little bit about what the Food Drink Europe study does and says, and then a bit about what the EIT food study does and says. And essentially, we're looking at... We all agree about the need for the transition to sustainable food systems, the, the fundamental questions are how much will it cost and how will we pay for it? At least those are two of the fundamental questions. So we'll start with the Food Drink Europe study, um, which we've done with consultants and thesis, which some of you may have come across. And we basically said to Anthesis, can you tell us how much it will cost to transition to sustainable farming? Easy question <laughs> in Europe. Not an easy question. But you can come up with a methodology, and they came up with a methodology, to, to get to a figure. And you may have seen other figures banded around from other research. The figure that comes out of this study is that the transition to more sustainable farming practices is estimated at between 37 and 52 billion euros per year in Europe. Per year. Per year. In the short term. Now, what do we mean by sustainable farming? And I could stand here for 20 minutes, no, actually probably 20 days, and we could talk about sustainable farming. What we've done for this study is really zoned in to looking after the soil, essentially. So we're looking at practices like reduced pesticide use, reduced fertilizer use, no tillage, and cover cropping, the, some of the, the, the practices that you talked about, Pavel. And what we wanted to do is put farmers central to this study. So rather than us telling farmers what you need to do, we wanted farmers to tell us what you are doing and how much it will cost. So we used a technique. Um, it's called willingness to attend. I don't know if anybody has come across that technique. Willingness to attend, I hadn't heard of it before either, is when you ask a farmer, well, how much will it take for you to take up different practices? And so farmers think about those different practices like reduced pesticides or reduced fertilizers or um, no-till or cover crops. They think about what it might mean in terms of new machinery that they would need or trading that they would need to take on. They think about it in, in terms of yield as well, yield decrease or yield increase. And so we ask for the farmer's perception, what their perceived costs would be to come to this figure. So it's a farmer central figure, which is, uh, a, a, well, an interesting way of coming to this figure, I think. So farmers are absolutely central to the study. Now, um, one thing we, we looked at as well was, well, if it's going to cost this much to do something, how much will it cost to do nothing? 
and these are quite widely available figures, but to do nothing, soil degrad degradation costs around 50 billion a year. So we've pretty much got to uh, cost neutral already. <laughs> Um, if you ask the FAO, they say soil damage may reduce crop yields by 10% by 2050. So the cost of doing nothing is vast. It's ridiculous. So what are we actually doing about it and how will we fund this transition? It's going to cost some money and who's going to pay for it and how? So the study um, looks at a few options. So the, these are not sort of um, food, drink, food Drink Europe endorsed uh, methodology or ways forward. It's just ideas in the pot from our survey. And we spoke to all sorts of people, including um, from the, the investment community, from the farming community and others. And we came up with all sorts of ideas that you would imagine. So targeted cap payments for specific outcomes on cap, um, getting access to funds, so helping farmers to access loans and things we've already heard about today already. Carbon markets as well. Monetizing other ecosystem services. For instance, we talk a lot about carbon. Well, what about biodiversity? What about water? What about monetizing other benefits? and also public-private partnerships. Um, a non-exhaustive list of some of the options that are available in terms of funding. Here, um, I, I asked our members in a bit of a snapshot survey, so how are you investing in regenerative agriculture? And they gave all of this, um, some bullet points from Nestle and Pepsi and McCain, Danone, Unilever, ADM, Cargill, DSM, General Mills. This is just a snapshot. Lots of our members are doing other things. And if you add all this together, you get to about two and a bit billion and 20 million acres, not just in Europe, across uh, North America as well. So there is some investment going into regenerative agriculture. There's some commitment from the private sector, but more will need to be done going forwards. That's the Food Drink Europe and thesis study, which will be out quite soon. Keep in touch with me or uh, pop me an email if you're particularly interested in seeing it when it comes out. And I'll just touch upon the, the EIT Food Lux Research Study as well, and some of the core th um, findings that have come out of that, which I think are really interesting. So this looks particularly closely at um, venture capital investment in three sustainability areas, or three areas, um, biopesticides, investment into biopesticides, um, the transition to plant protein away from animal protein, and also regenerative agriculture. And I think you'll find these quite interesting. When you look at the investment trends on regenerative agriculture, this paints a picture. The dark green is North America and the, the light green is Europe. You can see the, the venture, it's mostly venture capital investment, is huge from North America. Uh, next up is Europe, but you can see where most of the money is going on regen ag. In 2022, I think it's uh, 90, it now goes over to 90 million uh, US dollars and two-thirds is going into the US and a third into Europe. If you look at investment trends on plant proteins, you can see the big yellow block is North America. So that transition is being, uh, is being led out of North America as well. Uh, Europe there, along with Asia, has about 7% with South America. So you, th you, you hear kind of familiar names, Impossible Foods, Beyond Meat, et cetera, et cetera who are taking the lion's share of funding into this space. So again, we're, we are not leading the way in Europe as of yet. And then final piece um, is around biopesticides and where the money is going, where the venture capital money and spend is going to develop these sustainable options for crop protection. In, since 2018, funding has quadrupled with most of the investment in the US, 88%, again, huge, and the EU with 8%. Coming in... A, in second. The reason for the, the big focus on biopesticides, I think many of you know already, it's kind of about alternatives to conventional crop protection products, it's around sustainability, it's around consumer demand as well. But I think hopefully this paints a, a good picture of what things will cost, who is already putting money in, and when they are putting money, where it's actually going, and providing a bit of a thought starter for your conversation going forwards. Absolutely. Thanks. Thanks. Thanks, Will. That was a, a, an excellent presentation, actually. And my first reaction is that um, it's a bit gloomy. Um, so, but at least we know the size of the bill. We also know the size of the price of doing nothing. Uh, but we we'll also know that in Europe, we have a distance to cover. Of course, factor 10 or 9 compared to the US, but even uh, Asia 
is is now doing much more of doing a little bit more than than Europe. So I I think we have uh, that, that that's a gloomy that's the gloomy part. Also the sector itself to invest in um, we have very few unicorns. Uh, there th things take time in food. Um, you have to um, convince the value chain. Uh, there are, let's say, elements of the value chain which are quite traditional. So uh, it takes a lot of investing, it takes a lot of uh, time, it takes a lot of convincing. So basically, that's the challenge. Now, um, let's go and see what is available at the moment in terms of public funding, public funding instruments. I assume that there are a lot of developments there, um, and it's all about how can we also uh, entice private investments. So the good news is that there is some private investment coming in, but of course we still see uh, the uh, phenomenon that uh, we have uh, seedbed money and we have scale-up money at the end, but I think, uh, marie Elizabeth, you call it the valley of death, I think. Uh, I think it's a very... The valley of death uh, that you have to cross um, uh, before you are successful in in, in investment in in startup, um, and and that's a very nice description. But with that, I would love to first go to the public sector with your permission, Pavel, uh, and then go to the farmer perspective uh, because that I think I've 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 listened to Pavel before. There are some very nice uh, private uh, initiatives uh, as well on the farmer side. That is 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 very interesting to to hear from. But first, let's uh, uh, go to Adelaide and Adelaide. Maybe you can explain to us a little bit about based on current instruments, what are you doing? What can be done? But also, what kind of improvements um, are in the pipeline? Sure. <coughs> maybe just to start off. Um, obviously, my perspective will be from what we call a fund of funds perspective, looking at the venture capital availability and ecosystem to see you know, what the funding gaps are and what needs to be done. Um, so back in 2020, you know, when we were looking at climate environment and in particular agri-food, we devised a strategic plan to um, pursue three objectives essentially. One was to get more capital to market you know, because it had been very much underserved and I would say neglected by the wider financial community. Uh, the second objective was to help build out an investor ecosystem that could really support the development of the agri-food sector. And finally, and not least importantly, we really wanted to embed impact measurement and performance in, in all of the funds that we worked with, essentially. And, um, and again, back in 2020, when we looked at the market, what we saw was that the investor landscape was frankly very dire. There was maybe a handful of specialized agri-food investors operating in the market. And, um, and so, um, well, thankfully, you know, the perception of investors has changed over this time. And, um, you know, if you count now uh, the investor community, we probably have about 40 funds in Europe operating in the agri-food uh, market. So that has changed. And I would say that the EIF, I mean, we've tried to do our part in um, addressing both the funding gap and, and building, you know, the investors ecosystem, make sure, again, that it had uh, the breadth necessary to support agri-food innovation and ventures. And uh, we've supported about uh, 15 funds, invested $500 million, um, into these funds, and they in turn have mobilized, you know, I would say about um, yeah, five times our capital, so two billion euros to invest into agri-food innovation. Um, we're doing more this coming year. We already have six funds, you know, um, on our radar that we hope to back. And I think what's interesting to see is that over this time, you know, agri-food investment has certainly increased and quite substantially. So if we look back to 2012, venture capital investment in the agri-food industry in Europe was probably less than 500 million euros per year. And, um, and back in 2021, well, it hit an all-time high of 9 billion euros. Unfortunately, it hasn't stayed that way. And we know that, you know, over the course of 2022, it dropped quite significantly and was actually halved, but it's still, you know, higher than the levels in, in 2020. Um, so, um, I don't know, overall, I think that the financing available is still vastly insufficient in relation to both market needs as well as the market opportunity. 
I think that there are persisting gaps. So again, you know, uh, we have seen the investor ecosystem growing, but if you take a look at its composition, um, you see that most of the funds are early stage funds, and that there is, um, as we alluded to earlier, uh, earlier, a you know, very acute financing gap at at growth and scale up stage, and particularly for technologies that have a hardware component, you know, are more asset based, you know, have higher capital intensity. Financial investors have sh certainly shied away from these type of investments, and it's you know. Um, an area where we need to place more emphasis. So I'll leave it at that for the time being, and yeah, we'll pick up later. Perfect. Thanks, Adelaide. Maybe over to Michiel again, the same question. Um, you mentioned already the Pathfinder, but um, uh, and I know you're, you're in the job not too long, and you're still in the orientation phase, but um, do you have already a feeling which instruments are working and, and what kind of changes you would like to make going forward, or is that a bit too early? But just sort of to learn a bit your perspective well all the instruments we have work but they solve not the whole problem so, so if we look at the instruments the pathfinder is really still a, a grant based instrument to to what well, as it says to find a path to a technology and to a to a business model the transition does roughly the same but with another entry point so that is really let's say that is the moment you go into the valley of death and that's discovered then there is our perspective, there is enough funding available for 300,000, 400,000 tickets, let's say for seed money that's available. What the accelerator does is, let's say, the first jump into the valley of death where you still have three to four, five, six years of technology development to do before you have something you can show to a client or to a farmer. That is what we cover. The two things which are specifically different in agrotech or in food compared to quantum, I went to a quantum factory that's half this room. Uh, I went to a bio-based implants factory that's even one quarter of this room. But if you go into a, into food, you have to hit close to, to, to world market prices. And the only way of doing that is by building factories of, let's say, 10,000, 20,000 tons to start with. Yeah. So there's a huge capex investment. Um, and that stage, uh, so, so coming out of the valley of death, uh, and also, the, let's say, especially in, 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 in agriculture, where you have fragmented uh, still fragmented food market and also fragmented agriculture market. Let's say the, the time to get up the volumes of supply and the volumes of clients is quite substantial. So that there's still a risk. We have instruments to cover that. We have something called corporate days or where we invite larger companies to connect to our startups. But um, I'm really concerned about, let's say, the, the second and the third value of death. Um, as a board, we are very happy with the step plan. So let's say the, the initiative of the commission proposed to the member states to have, let's say, larger tickets basically to cover the, the capex kind of investments in the next stage, but it's still under consideration by the member states. But uh, we will certainly recommend to have, a, let's say, a, a kind of consolidator instrument or a post-accelerator instrument in FP10. Um, but this, that's 2027, so it's a bit like, oh, you have to wait four years and then, uh, <laughs> then we will have something. And the urgency is high. Um, yeah, so so so, so I, I, we cannot offer uh, a resolve. Uh, one thing I'm, I would like to work as well is that within the portfolio of of, of the EIC, the food and agri is a s substantial, but far the, far from the largest portfolio, probably the third or fourth one. Uh, so um, there is option to grow, to to help more beneficiaries with good proposals. So, so also the, the flow, and Ivan is working hard on it, and to get a, a bigger flow of applicants is also a way to, 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 to grow that up. Maybe as a follow-up question, because we, we, we learn from, and, and Pavel has a chance to, to talk to us about that, that it's not that easy to apply for finance for, let's say, uh, a, a, a beneficiary, a farmer, or, or somebody who's really in need of, of, of investments. There's a lot of bureaucracy. Is, are there any plans to streamline that? Or maybe uh, within the European community, are there any sort of options for um, better working together? Or um, do you see something in I'm, that I'm direction? I'm going to be very blunt here on two things. Well, one is that the success rates of applications to the ESC are not higher nor lower than applying for a VC. The difference in with a VC is that you don't get an answer if you send something in. We always oblige to send an answer because we do, let's say, mature real evaluation processes. Uh, yes, it could be simplified. 
but we have simply 14 to 15 times more applicants than we have money to spend. So if we make it simple, we, we have the same amount of disappointed people, but let's say maybe they had a simpler process to apply for. Um, so yeah, I, I can't make it, we cannot make it uh, nicer. Um, saying that what is also important is that especially in the accelerator or in the accelerator we only provide equity when it is matched by private capital and one thing we see happening is because of that and the quality of so let's say our process of, of qualification is more far depth more in depth than any vc does so a lot of vcs like what we do we have made a kind of shopping mall for them and they can pick the, they can pick winners so um so that is an, a benefit um, and the second thing is that that indeed we ask private investors to come in and also to take to be the lead investor, because uh, because as in the SC as a go, as in European Commission we're not tooled to play the role of a chairman of a board of supervisors, uh, right. board of commissaires. So so we also bring through the investors also the private knowledge and the market knowledge. Um, it's but it's a work to I think that's that's very ambitious and also promising, the, 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 the objective of the Commission is as well to create a European VC market. The US has it already, but the, you don't create it at one. And that, that will take also 10, 10 years of time to create that. And uh, that's a very promising avenue, because if you look at, we have now around 700 companies funded. That means that we have around 2,000 private investment tickets. So that's a quite a big community. It's, uh, because it's become the uh, EIC is becoming <coughs> is becoming the largest deep tech investor in the world. Yeah, yeah. Thanks. I saw Adelaide nodding as well. Maybe you want to add something, Adelaide, at this stage. Uh, no, I just think. Uh, no, I think it's um, uh, as Michaela was saying. You know, it's important to really make sure that we have all the financing instruments in place that are required to finance a venture from you know the initial idea up through growth and expansion and it's really trying to make sure that all the pieces of the puzzle are in place and, and it's not obvious and there are certain segments and as we were saying stages of financing that frankly are very much uh, underserved and we have to again uh, try to pull together these public mm, no, private partnerships to make sure that these uh, funding gaps are, are covered. Yeah, and there is, I mean, there is still a gap between. <laughs> For example, <laughs> exactly, which yeah. is the one that needs to be filled. So, yeah. Okay, thank you. Now, Pavel, turning over to you uh, as the recipient. Um, we are, of course, very eager to learn your perspective on what alternatives, uh, what alternative instruments do you see on the ground? Uh, and 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 what, what alternatives to the existing EU uh, schemes uh, work in, in your opinion? What, 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 what do you see happening? Okay, before we will start to discuss about the instruments, <coughs> I think that first of all we need to answer what we would like to do, first of all. So what I see, the challenges what we have at the moment is uh, the first point that we had not defined what the sustainable mean actually yeah, because we have many many different definitions sustainable farming regenerative farming organic farming yeah without any discussion about climate because all of us in that room i think we agreed that we need to deliver us as a humans good quality food good quality in the good two dimensions first of all it need to be fresh of course and and uh, all that schemes what are about that and second it should feed us so the fertility of that food should be and a good uh, quality and currently this is not obvious of course and the second point is the climate and all the changes the climate is warmer and warmer so we need to protect the earth and we need to reduce the emission currently scientists told us that 50 percent of our emission global emission came from food industry i personally disagree but never mind if it's 50 or 30 never mind it is and we need to reduce that so we need to balance that and in my opinion the best way is to convert into regenerative. Uh, thank you, Michel, you hadn't said that farmers are difficult in the mentality. <laughs> but I'm the farmer, I know something about that. <laughs> so we have some fears, some barriers. And in my opinion, 90% of our EU farmers is not ready for uh, conversion into the regenerative farming. So they are not definitely ready to convert into organic. So, in my opinion, regenerative farming is some compromise between that 
traditional synthetic pesticizer and, and synthetic um, pesticides and synthetic fertilizer, and this organic what is quite difficult to manage. So the question is, what does it mean to be regenerative? How to define that? And then how to prove that our farming, our agriculture, is really regenerative. What does it mean that this food on our plate is really green, green without any emissions? So, in my opinion, the definition of regenerative farming is that farming which basically uh, cares about five pillars. First of them is uh, balanced nutrients in the soil, and the fodders, and the pastures, and finally in the food. What is the beginning of fertility and our health? The second is carbon sequestration and all the practices which reduce uh, the emission because uh, uh, and increase the, the organic matter in the soil because uh, as we know three of uh, 70 percent so three quarters of uh, carbon which we have already in our earth is under the ground only one quarter is above the ground and in the oceans so this is the good way to use agriculture to sequestrate it, the carbon dioxide under the ground. And 1% of uh, organic matter in the soil on every single hectare means 70 tons of carbon dioxide sequestrated in the soil. And this is also 70 tons of additional water which could be used for the crops. The third pillar is, of course, soil covering and sustainable grazing what is also the part of regenerative farming. The fourth pillar is the limited cultivation, minimal soil disturbance, and the fifth pillar is, the, of course, the pest reduction, synthetic fertilizer reduction, biodiversity, uh, all the small retention of water, and good relation with the local societies. So these are these five pillars. The question is how to describe the certification program, let's say, maybe not certification, but how to prove that farmers will produce in that way uh, in really, really regenerative food. About organic, we have quite advanced yeah. uh, certification. So uh, to, to start all the journey and all the path uh, with the transition of our food, we need to convince all the players in that supply chain. Uh, so maybe I will answer from my perspective, I'm the primary producer, so I'm the farmer. The next step is, of course, industrial uh, food industry, what I'm connected also, but I'm definitely not a specialist in the packaging and, and retailing and supplying. Uh, so that's the role of uh, EIT Food, for example, to connect all these players. But if we talk about the farmers and food industry, I think that tools, what we need, uh, should be divided in few scopes. First, uh, what we have already. First, what we have already in, in Europe is area payment. I'm not sure if it's a good uh, solution. Only give money to the farmers. So the area payment, and definitely not. I think because if we leave farmers with money without enough support, we will not achieve the goals. Yes. So we we should have, of course, the a REA payment, the subsidies per each hectare, because this is the guarantee of uh, cheap food for us consumers, finally. But parallelly, I think that we should find some tools to support institutions which will support farmers and food industry to deliver the goals. So in my opinion, these institutions uh, which uh, should be supported are laboratories to test food with the nutrients balance, to test uh, fodders, to test soil, to, to prove that this, what we eat and what we have in the soil and the pasture is really balanced and sustainable, what we would like to have. Then I think we need to support the institutions which cares about research and developments. We desperately need new solutions, more efficient solutions, and deliver them to the industry and, and uh, agriculture. Uh, this is uh, uh, not to discuss, of course. The, the third point is what the ne we need to support the advisory companies, the companies which will uh, share the knowledge to the farmers, which will teach them how to manage the soil, how to change the life on the farm, hold the farm, not on the single crop or on the, some small piece of land, just how to manage, hold the farm. And uh, finally, we, of course, need to sell this production, this regenerative production. We will not achieve the goal if that production will be too small, because industry needs ha need to have some big amounts of food 
enough food to cover the needs on the market. So if we supply a few hundred tons of regenerative food, there's nothing for, for food industry. So we need to engage that process and include more farmers to convert that. When I look from the Polish farming perspective, the average size of Polish farm, if you can imagine, is 11 and a half hectares. So what is the power of the farm which has 11 and a half hectares? As a buyer and as a seller. In my opinion, this is very limited. So uh, in my opinion, what we need uh, is some symbiotic model to create the relation between farmers locally with some leader who will teach the farmers how to manage the soil, but finally deliver them services as a contractor, because we have many barrier barriers to buy some equipment. Time to time we had many, many different solutions to finance very expensive machinery equipment, which were not especially efficient in the usage. So to use and utilize this, uh, this machinery equipment and all the solutions which are necessary to, to produce food, and finally organize the sellers to the industry to deliver very equal regenerative uh, amounts of food to the industry. And if we will show, if we show the, the benefits of regenerative food to the industry, what means lower carbon footprint, uh, less residues of pesticides inside, I, I'm, I'm very, uh, I think and I believe that, that industry will be also convinced to do this. Thank you. Interesting perspective. Maybe a quick uh, round around the panel. A, a, a question is if there would be one thing that you could mention to accelerate the needed transition in the food system that you see now, what <laughs> point would that be? How can we really accelerate? Maybe start with Adelaide, from your perspective. Again, I think I've already mentioned it earlier, but uh, certainly getting more capital to market. And I think it's clear for everyone here that public financing alone isn't going to do it. We, we really need more private sector participation. That would certainly include corporates, because I think corporates have their role to play, both in pushing innovation and you know throughout the, the value chain, but also contributing investment towards agri-food innovation. I think um, we need to see more of them in venture capital funds and or f similar financing um, uh, vehicles and models. Um, I would say other institutional investors, like insurance companies, pension funds, um, frankly, they've never had much interest in the venture capital asset class. And uh, I would argue that if they really are interested in ensuring a stable and secure future, they should invest in it and help shape it. And that you know, starts with um, financing innovation. And then, I mean, we've been in discussion you know, with EIT Food and other uh, stakeholders in the community. And I think it would be very interesting to build out um, a community and financing platform that can again bring all the stakeholders and uh, players together um, to facilitate investment, maybe even create an investment platform, build relationships, business development opportunities, the uptake of innovation, and um, I think there's a huge opportunity for that. And again, uh, late stage financing, I think it's, um, we have some homework to do there. We've just launched the uh, ETSI, the European Tech Champions Initiative. It's not specifically geared towards the agri-food sector, but it is meant to help uh, scale <coughs> European ventures and support to billion euro funds. We haven't seen many of them in Europe, and they then in turn can really write those investment tickets that um, European uh, companies and ventures need to get on that um, yeah, uh, growth path. But I think there's a lot more, again, that we can do there and that the public sector in general can help support. Thank you. Yeah. Michiel, your perspective? Yeah, one of the things we intend to do as a board next year is to set up a, a working group on syndication and exits. And that's basically how to attract private money. And um, I like to test things in my private environment. My father, my father-in-law, has a, is managing the family fund. That's 42 hectares of land, but he's a very passive investor. Uh, and my brother-in-law is is working at a big bank, and they have a huge ownership of land in the Netherlands. But they also very, are quite passive investors. So I want to test with them how, how what what arguments do I need to challenge them, um, and and then if we have a meeting in in January to roll out a, a broader consultation to see how we can mobilize private capital, because there's a lot of it, especially linked to land. Um, and as um, 
Will has showed us that that's the degradation of land value is an important uh, thing. So keeping the land value is an important investment uh, the, uh, ratio. But I think we have to understand those because in agriculture they are different than in let's say in quantum or in medtech. So that's one thing. The second thing is that um, if I if I bring down the accelerator, which is around uh, nine billion euros, if 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 ten percent goes to agrofood, I don't think so, Stefan. Uh, Ivan coming but even then it's 1 billion it's 1 billion let's compare to 640 billion euro cap yeah yeah yeah. Fu yeah funding so there's also how to cleverly combine them and the third thing i would look at that the, the the accelerator and the ic is very much let's say private company oriented so we we i think 99 percent of the funding goes to limited companies uh, as, as, as I ran in french uh, limited companies in, in English or Beves in the Netherlands. And a very particular structure in many countries in Europe is the, co the cooperative structure. So I would also like to investigate whether cooperative structures can also be either eligible, I think probably they are, but let's say can be made attractive in, in, in setting up, let's say, especially the shared facilities you need to process uh, in novel processes um, agricultural uh, produce. Thank you, Pavel. Any thoughts hearing what you've just heard? Yeah, it's good to hear that we'll have money for that. <laughs> However, uh, what I've mentioned before, we need to define what is the, the target, what is the goal, then create the path and build some network to share the knowledge within the farmers. It's much easier to manage a few hundreds organizations within the Europe for the sharing the knowledge than millions of uh, farmers across the whole of Europe. So I would rather invest into the knowledge sharing. <coughs> Thank you. Good. I think I, it's now time to open up the um, the floor for questions, remarks, maybe some brilliant ideas. You know, hearing what you've just heard and digesting. Are there any questions, remarks in the room? Yeah, I'm going to give you the mic. Yes. Thank you very much. It's very interesting. Um, I am a consumer researcher, so I um, um, study what consumers do and why they do that. Um, what I'm missing, and, and it's often when I speak to uh, investors, is the consumer perspective. And I believe that if we know what consumers want, and particularly if they want in the future, it would be very um, wise to invest in those uh, technologies, those products that consumers actually want. But um, in, in this um, 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 session so far, I heard very little about the consumer perspective. Um, and that's, that's a bit puzzling to me. So um, I'm hoping that anyone can, uh, you know, explain um, how the consumer is taken into um, account when making investment decisions and plans. Of course, that's uh, valid. You want to say something, Michiel? Well, I have a kind and unkind answer. The kind yeah. answer, yeah. In, in our system, any applicant has to show the market rollout and has to demonstrate that they've understood what can the consumers want. So, so that's part of, let's say, an application process, and a successful one can show, let's say, the pathway to the market, and that they can, they have understood consumer preferences. Um, that's the nice side. The nice side is that that's basically a lot of technologies are so expensive that basically it's very hard to test the consumer wish because unless you scale up, you're yeah. basically in a in a in a niche market, uh, and you cannot generalize it. So that 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 is a challenge. On the other hand, that's a different experience. In the stage we are in some innovations, we are at such a low level that there is there is ample. For example, for, for protein transition for for meat replacement, there is sufficient market, but it's still at a very low level. Yeah, yeah. And the and the dynamics if to go from one to three percent are totally different than from three to ten, or let alone from ten to forty percent. So uh, and that is difficult to to, to research. Uh, I, I was a researcher in, in in textiles myself on these kind of themes. It's extremely difficult to study. Mm -hmm. Uh, the demand for non-existing products, or for uh, products that have, let's say, a, a very difficult market uh, market pricing position. And maybe just from a fund perspective, there are funds that are specialized more in sort of downstream uh, products and uh, consumer-facing products, and that are trying to um, 
gauge, you know, consumer demand and needs. But I think it's not only about demand, but it's also changing, helping to change consumer lifestyles. I mean, I think um, so it, it really goes both ways. But uh, there are some specialized investors certainly looking at the consumer perspective. Yeah, of course, in the first session, w we've heard very much about the behaviors and consumer trends. So we as a farmers always try to deliver what consumer needs. Yeah, there's no sense to produce food, which is not acceptable. So, you know, we see that consumers want to be uh, with, with less or lower impact on the environment. And that's the reason why we reduce the synthetic fertilizer, pesticides, etc. All the regenerative farmer farming is the answer for consumer needs. Thinking about uh, Will's presentation, you showed some financial instruments which could be rolled out uh, to change the behavior of farmers, for example, um, biodiversity credits that could help them earn from um, uh, using more sustainable practices. And thinking about consumers, I was wondering if we could also imagine you know, some sort of credits for consumers that are paying green premiums on products. Um, so that the only fi like the only instruments that we seem to be thinking about for changing consumer behavior right now is making them f uh, valorize more and more in their uh, purchasing decisions the sustainable aspects. But there sh maybe there needs to be also a financial aspect, and perhaps they could accumulate uh, credits related to their purchasing decisions, which could then be funded somehow. Um, via European Union instruments, which at the end of the day would come out of tax dollars, but, uh, yeah. Yeah, no, I, 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 I like the idea. I'm not the one who, who is um, able to comment on that. I don't know, anyone from the panel wishes to comment on this. It, it, it's, it's, a, it's a complicated thing. And I think we, we had this session uh, with Klaus about, about the consumer observat observatory. Um, you know where um, uh, consumers tend to take uh, sh shortcuts and and not always react in, in, in a logic in a logic way, uh, but I think we can. It's safe to assume, indeed, like Michiel said, you know, it's we are talking about a, a niche at the moment, and it's really developing. I mean, two years ago, uh, and now, if you look at alternative proteins, it's really enormous what's what's happening, and fermentation technologies are being developed, precision fermentation. Then of course we have the issue of the novel foods that we that we that we've heard, and it's really just to show you how complex the system is, and that if we don't take a, a systems approach, uh, you know, in innovation, then we are missing certain elements uh, of it. But I'm 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 fairly hopeful that we can you know move forward. I see a lot of energy and enthusiasm even today. Uh, you know, when you look at the participation, people are, you know, even networking outside of the sessions, companies that are talking to institutions, that are talking to, um, you know, public engagement uh, uh, people. So this is really the way we should, we should go about uh, and, 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 and really accelerate, uh, because, of course, uh, I don't want to be too gloomy. Uh, many people are gloomy. I think what's happening now, not too many people are optimistic that we can stay win within the 1.5 uh, degree bracket. Um, uh, I mean, every time I'm looking at the um, at the news, I, I see pessimistic messages. I see I see a lot of uh, issues and talking to, um, uh, let's say, corporate uh, uh, CEOs, uh, I also see different levels of sophistication and understanding. Uh, but I think the community is is working, um, and and we should just full steam. I'm very happy with with Michiel and and Adelaide on the panel, um, also talking about their you know investment approach, and and you know I think there should be private money involved. And Will, as a representer of the um, let's say the corporate world, I don't know whether you still talk to your brother. Uh, you're allowed to talk to your brother, uh, because because there's a lot of uh, polarization there as well. And it's obvious that uh, there is not one single solution. Everybody should, should work uh, for the same goal and, and purpose. And therefore, I'm, I'm super happy with all the research that, that, that we're doing. And if you see the math, I mean, if the open bill is about 30 billion, uh, but the, the cost of doing nothing is 50, and the, and the corporates are already getting 20, uh, two, 2 billion, it, it, it was roughly, I mean, you can't compare the numbers, it's apples and, and oranges. 
but that that shows me that we are stepping up um, and uh, that's why it's so important to continue the dialogue and continue the research any other question um, sure, sure, if may I so of course Pavel, go ahead about this reversible tax um, i'm afraid that if we think that the farmer will be the final destination of the reversible tax it's a, a small mistake because finally we will pay more for food if we do this the reversible tax the math from from math presentation is that we are losing every single year how, how much how many uh, 50 bi 50 billion. 50 billion what i know across whole the, the world Every single year we have the, the, the loss of 15 million hectares soil. 15 million hectares is actually the same what we have in Poland. So we can imagine the gross domestic, domestic production from agriculture. Every single year disappeared because of uh, wind erosion, water erosion, flooding, all that things, such things. So uh, the best way is to manage that loss, to, to manage the soil in a different way and preserve us against to that loss. Of course, it not uh, definitely means that the consumer, customer, final um, consumer will pay for that transition, not. From my perspective, 15 years of experience, I know that I, I've made many mistakes with that regenerative farming. And every single success was a one step further, but <coughs> every single mistake was a three step back. And uh, earlier we start, earlier the benefits we achieve to convert the, the food production later we start it will cost us much more uh, definitely yeah yes kevin i give you the mic and you give it to your neighbor later working at the side of farmers who are trying to transition and also corporates who want to engage in regenerative ag i think that the there are some things that have been said here that are super important. Cooperatives are different bodies than startups or traditional corporates. And for an investor, investing in a corporate is something that is very difficult. Same thing, uh, when we are talking about startups, when we are talking about technology, those are assets that we can understand and we can document them. Here we are talking about investing in restoration of soil so is there a way we, we could also be innovative in the uh, funding and investment schemes and 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 ve vehicles we should invent vehicles to to address that traditional vc and and even you uh, you as you say you you can invest in startups difficult to invest in corporate in cooperatives you can invest in a startup that has a technology. How can you, could you one day invest in a, in a farm that would restore its soil as an asset? I, I'm not talking about the co-ops, to be honest, about cooperation. Yeah. So uh, the question is how do you establish and how do you uh, describe the, the rules of that? It should be in the business realistic uh, conditions. So. If we have very small farms, and we have them, that's a fact. Th this These farms don't have any power. 78% of Polish cropping structure are the cereals. Where is the biodiversity? There's nothing. Why do we have 78% of cereals in Poland? I don't know. I, I'm, not, I, I'm not sure what is the situation in Germany, Hungary, but I believe that this is very similar. So what is the reason of that? The small farmers don't have enough power for investment. In my opinion, there's no sense to build any financial instrument to supply the machinery equipment to that small farms. But we can sign a contract, we can find these leading farms or companies, never mind trading companies, which will support small farmers, or never mind small or not, which will support farmers with the knowledge, with the technology, with the services, uh, with uh, uh, suitable contracts, because this trading company has usually the direct connection with the food industry. They know what the food industry needs, what are the expectation, what are the indication and all the requirements necessary for the food. And then arrange that in this area where, where they operate. So it's not a co-op, it's a trading company or it's a trading relation which involves many, many actors in that 
role. So everything needs to be paid and need to be in this realistic business conditions, in my opinion. It's not a co-op like we have after the Second World War. Is that the, uh, is that the answer for the question? If not, <laughs> just this. Yes, I, I'm, I'm going to bring another topic in the future of food that is aquaculture and not for not only for fish but also for uh, seaweed because it's uh, also uh, an, another championship altogether in everything and i would like maybe to ask michael and and adelaide what kind of instruments are there that startups uh, can use uh, in this area of aquaculture, um, mainly for, for seaweed and innovative aquaculture uh, systems like RAS, uh, I'm sorry if I'm talking a different language here. <laughs> but, um, yes, that's my question. Um, I cannot be v very specific now, but I, I'm going to help a bit. Um, within our instruments, we have open calls or open themes and challenges. So in challenges, we can go more in depth into a specific theme. So I would advise everyone to watch carefully before Christmas some or just after Christmas, the work program of the ESC for next year. Um, however, um, in practice, um, for us, since it's that open is the biggest part of the program, um, there are projects, there are startups that are in aquaculture that have applied, that have even been funded, and that could be strengthened in the in the in the in the, in the future. But there's nothing against good proposals uh, being applicable in, in that area. On our end, actually, and you may already be familiar with it, the Blue Invest program of the European Commission. Uh, we've actually been awarded uh, resources to manage under that program and we're really striving to build out the investor community, which in, in the, the agri-food uh, space, it was sparse. In, in blue economy, it was frankly inexistent. Um, so we have supported a number of funds over the last couple of years that are um, active both in the early and late stage segment and looking at aquaculture. We hope to announce a new fund soon. Um, that is specifically looking at aquaculture and we'll be partnering with a, um, I would say, a leading impact organization. So the fund will be working with the impact organization to ensure that, you know, all the practices that are applied to aquaculture are sustainable and that, um, and that frankly, the, the companies that are getting financing are um, having a positive climate environmental uh, impact and, and reversing yeah, current uh, practices. And um, and so through the Blue Invest, we've supported now, um, for example, Ocean 14. They're more late stage. They're looking both at uh, seaweed and aquaculture. Um, we've also supported a Norwegian fund, Sarsia Ventures, that also is looking at the blue economy, both um, um, aquaculture as well as marine energy. Um, and again, we have a number of other funds in the pipeline. There's another fund, uh, Sven Blue Ocean, a French player, also looking very closely at the space. So again, gradually the community is building up and, um, and the market is finally garnering uh, the, the attention it deserves, I would say. Yeah. Thank you for that perspective. And that reminds me that we haven't even talked about uh, the social impact of funding, right? Because that's another... Uh, uh, st funding stream and, and I, I, I'm aware of the Bezos Earth Foundation of course uh, putting one billion in alternative protein and uh, that's also adding up uh, anyway I just want to maybe one last question um, and then I'll close then I'll close yeah. thank you very much my name is Marga Vindges I'm from uh, greenhouse industry or something like that. Uh, my question is about, uh, do we know what we do? I'm missing a little bit the investments for really compare different ways of making food or producing food with each, with, with each other on their impact of our uh, planet on sustainability because as a consumer, I'm not really informed. <laughs> no, I, 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 I do understand your remark, but I can uh, assure you from, from, let's say, my personal experience that we are 
investing in completely different ways of producing and, and upcycling our side streams uh, and, and precision fermentation, biomass fermentation. It's fantastic what's, what's happening. Uh, this session, however, was only one hour and 20 minutes. So, you know, if you want to really talk about it, but especially the alternative protein, and I, I, I do imagine why Michiel is so keen on it. And there's a lot of things happening there. Um, uh, but of course, different fields. So I, there I can reassure you, uh, uh, but uh, uh, I do understand the background of your question. With that, uh, I do want to close. I want to thank my fellow panelists uh, for this um, uh, great session. Um, I think we had a good uh, discussion. I like the uh, involvement of the audience. To reassure you that we won't lose, let's say, the main messages that we discussed today is we're going to put um, the recommendations and the information of this session into a manifesto. I'm looking at Marie Elisabeth. Um, and um, uh, we want to be pragmatic. I mean, that's paper, but really uh, we want to, as EIT Food, with our community, take really the next steps that it is necessary to transform our food system. Again, I'd like to thank the panel for the participation. I'd like to thank the audience for the engagement. And uh, I wish you uh, a nice continuation uh, of the program. So thanks for your participation. Thank you.